Hi, this is Nick from When Prague and Power Unite, and my guest today is Richard Hensall from the band Haken. Did I pronounce that right, Hen? Almost, almost. It's Henshaw. Henshaw. H- yeah, that's right. That's I got correct. a real cockney bit in there on that. Yeah, Henshaw. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll start with a nice general question here. Haken is, of course, a relatively new band. You just put out your first album on Sensory Records named Aquarius. Uh, why don't you tell yeah. me a little bit about the history of the band? Uh, well, basically, the band uh, was formed by me, um, the singer, Ross Jennings, and the old guitarist, Matthew Marshall. Uh, it's formed in about, what was, about five or six, well, about six or seven years ago, actually, just before we went off to study, uh, uh, do our degrees. Um, we decided to form the band, go off and study for three years, and then come back and um, you know, form it properly and get things going. Um, so we did that, went, done our degrees, came back, um, and then we went on the hunt for kind of new members, kind of fresh blood, uh, and then we found Pete Jones, the keyboard player, or the old keyboard player, um, and we found Raymond Hearn, which is our current drummer. Uh, we found him on a forum, actually, online. I think it was actually a Dream Theater forum. It might have even been, yeah, the Dream Theater forum, where I met you. Actually. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I'm uh, pretty sure that's where we met Pete, and then Ray was a friend of Pete's. Um, and then, I think it was about two years ago now, that Matt and Pete you know, went off to pursue other careers and you know, pursue their other you know, studies, and Matt went to study law, and Pete went to do physics. Uh, so we were kind of we were a bit stuck, so we decided to carry on, you know, keep things moving, and that's when we found Diego... Um, just a great keyboard player, and Charlie, um, you know, ridiculously mental guitarist. And then we kind of recorded the album, really, and that's where we are today. Now, how, how old? I remember back in the day I got sent some demos of songs called uh, Snow and Souls. How old are those? Uh, I think well, we, we recorded that in about 2007, I think we recorded that demo. Yeah. And that's actually what got us signed, really, to, to Sensory Records. Um, Ken got a copy of this demo, and then he, he liked what he heard, and yeah, so that's, that's how we got to Aquarius, really. Yeah. Yeah, so about, about three years ago that was, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll be honest that back when I first got those and I played them, they, they were generally well received, but I honestly wasn't too huge on them, but when I got Aquarius, the new record, I absolutely loved it. Yeah, I mean, to, well, the, the quality of the recording on the demo wasn't amazing, I actually done this in my um, in my old house when I was living with my parents, and um, I did it in my loft, and that's, that's where I recorded that. So it's not the greatest quality recording, and the music it, it kind of flowed to a certain degree, but it wasn't it didn't feel like one piece of work really. As well, actually, we recorded the demo in two two stages, so a year apart. Uh, so the music didn't really feel like one one unit. So. When when we wrote Aquarius, we kind of um, you know did it in one go, and the idea was to have all the, the themes kind of flowing together and have one cohesive piece of music, really. Yeah, and that really yeah. came through. I thought it really does flow very nicely from beginning to end. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. Um, what were some of the influences you personally, and maybe some collective influences of the band going into Aquarius? Yeah, well, we all we've all got kind of got a diverse range of influences. Um, I've kind of grown up with a bit of Floyd, you know, Gentle Giant, um, you know, from my dad. And my mum's got a huge um, love for, for jazz music, so I've, that was always drawn into me from a young age. And um, I came from a kind of classical background, so there's always that classical influence as well, you know, like Debussy, that kind of that kind of a mm-hmm. composer. And um, well, the other guys in the band, Diego's heavily into jazz, so is Tom. But we, we all kind of meet in the middle, and then progressive music is kind of where we meet in the middle. And that's like our common ground, really. Yeah. But we all, yeah, we all kind of go off and do our own thing. But um, I've I've always loved, you know, like hip hop, kind of drum and bass music. It's a bit of everything, really, and um, just fuse it all together and create one sound. So yeah, so I'd say it's kind of completely diverse. Okay. Um, for those who don't know, you play guitar and keyboards on the record. Yeah, that's are, correct. Are there any other instruments you play aside from that that didn't you didn't play on the record, or is that it? 
Well, uh, yeah, I used to play clarinet from a young age um, when I was you know, a lot younger. And um, I also studied drums for two years and, um, you know, done my own studies on that as well. Um, so, yeah, a few other instruments, but I don't play those on the album at all. I wouldn't say I'm good enough, <laughs> all right. to be honest. Uh, while, yeah. we're, while we're on the subject here of other instruments, you guys did get a few guests to play some odds and ends stuff on the record. Yeah, <laughs> quite quite a few few guys. Yeah, well, basically Ray is studying down at the Guildhall in London, and he's he's been there for two years now. So as you can imagine, he's got a lot of musical musical friends in his circle. Um, so he just asked them for a favour, and they they obliged. Okay. And, um, Kind of, I reckon it adds another dimension to the music. Quite an organic dimension. Yeah. Now, now being British, the band here, I'm go- I'm going to make an assumption that you guys may or may not like soccer. Ah, uh, so, so I'm sorry. You mean, you mean you mean you mean football? Yeah. <laughs> is Is there any chance we'll get the now infamous Vuvuzela on the next record? Ah, uh, well, of course. We'll have a Vuvuzela kind of section, I think. Yeah, and a, and a football chant to go to back it up. I think yeah. that'd be a good idea. Yeah, I'm I'm quite disappointed that we didn't beat you guys, actually, uh, in the World Cup. I'm pretty sure we could have easily done it if we wanted to. Well, you you got a tie, I mean... Yeah, well, that it was good for you. It, 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 I guess. It, it was a good, good result for you guys, but, I mean, we, we should have won, really. <laughs> yes, it's, it's kind of sad when there's a tie and one country is celebrating and the other is mourning. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, yeah, that sums it up really. But I'm not huge on football. I quite, I'm quite enjoying the, the World Cup, but um, it's all still a laugh, really. <laughs> all right, <laughs> back to Aquarius here. Um, yeah, I, I find it to be a very nice blend of what I'd say traditional progressive rock and a more open-ended, uh, eclectic style, very jazzy in a way. And yeah. I think it's very amazing how you guys can seem to flow between one and the other and not have it seem jagged, how it seems very natural. How, how do you guys manage to do that? Well, I mean, if you listen to the demo, I think um, it's not as smooth, some of the transitions. Um, and because I write the music um, largely, um, I, spend, I spend hours, if I'm honest, just fusing it together and going over it and over it and making sure that it sounds completely smooth and all the transitions are working nicely. Um, so I'd just say um, hard work, <laughs> basically, and just and put in the hours. That's, that's basically what it is. There's no um, magic formula, really. Hmm. And and how do you normally <laughs> write the song? Do you I kind of do one thing on an instrument and then build everything else up around there? Or do you like focus on a section and just do all the instruments at once for that section? Yeah, well, kind of... Well, on Aquarius... Most of the themes came about on the piano. Um, as you can probably hear on the album, it's quite um, it's kind of driven by the piano and the keyboards, really. Um, so I, I usually come up with a theme on the piano and then write it down, listen to it back via the MIDI, and, and then kind of add a riff behind it and then just build it. You build it that way, really. That's, that's how it kind of builds. Okay. Now, on on the record, like I said, you you play guitar and keyboards, but you also yep. have a guitarist and a keyboardist. Ah, yes. When yes. it ti- comes time to record a part, is there an epic match of rock, paper, scissors on who gets to do it? Is there a big chess match? How, how does that get decided? <laughs> I don't know. I think we kind of share it out equally, so, so there's no kind of huge, huge egos in the band. So um, sometimes it might fit for Charlie to to rip out a solo in a certain section and sometimes it might fit for me to uh, rip out a solo in a certain section and uh, likewise with uh, Diego and I. Okay. Um, but there's also times where I'll be on the keyboards and then the song needs a guitar solo so obviously I wouldn't be able to do it so Charlie would, would take the um, take the throne in that sense. Yeah, so that's, that's how we kind of really work it out really. All right. Now, now I know the uh, vocalist in the band, Ross Jennings. He does the lyrics, but I figured you could probably give us a little bit of an insight on the themes that got used on the album. Here, it, it has two very big themes. Yeah. Well, in terms of the um, the plot and the concept, yeah, well, it's basically about water, as you could have probably um, imagined. But I've got I've got it written down here. Actually, what Ross has written, 
It's basically said the Aquarius concept was spawned from the idea of tracking the journey of a water particle from its conception on a mountain spring through stream, river, lake, and ocean. Um, hence, you know, the titles of some of the songs. Um, this was a starting point of a story that became more about global warming and the effects of pollution. When the planet is in the shadow of an, an inevitable flood, a mermaid child is born. Uh, the significance of her existence is essential to the survival of the human race, but not without sacrifice. So that kind of that's the underlying theme, basically, and the the, the lyrics are more of a metaphor to that underlying theme. Um, so it's quite ambiguous, but it's good to leave it to the imagination of the listener. I think, as many bands often do. Yeah, <laughs> I don't understand half the concepts that I'm listening to, but it kind of it adds it adds another dimension to the music. I think when you have when you don't fully understand it, yeah, it leaves it leaves a lot to your imagination. As long as the guy who's singing it knows what he's talking about, that then you're pretty good. <laughs> exactly, that's the key. Now, now my personal favorite on the album is the last track, "Celestial Elixir." And uh, yeah. <laughs> I have no problem calling it a true progressive masterpiece. I won't say it about something brand new very often because you always want to see how it ages. But I just love that song and especially the chorus to death. How how did that come together? Where, was that an early written uh, song? Is that something more recent? Well, basically that I, I kind of wrote the whole album. Um, you know, the six songs: one, two, three, four, five, six. And then I came to writing the last song, and I I, I needed. I thought it was essential to have a big climax, an epic finale. So I, I took a lot of the themes uh, throughout the album, and uh, I used it for the for the opening sequence uh, of the piece, which is about three or four minutes long. Um, so you, you'll hear a lot of themes from streams and point of no return, and then it kind of went into the verse, and then the chorus just just kind of flowed. I think from the from the verse, where it kind of flowed naturally. Uh, at first, I thought, oh, "God, this is a bit cheesy, you know. Is it, is it going to work? Oh, I don't know." Um, but after we got it into the rehearsal room and we played it, and then Ross laid down his uh, vocals on that chorus, it really, really came to life. And um, yeah, and I think I'm really, really proud of how that sounds. Um, but yeah, so a lot of those themes come back in the instrumental section, and then close the, the album. Actually, so the theme that closes the album is actually a theme from uh, Point of No Return. And, um, yeah, that's how it came about. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, like I say, that's I just absolutely love that song. It's a perfect close to the album, I thought. And it is essentially, as you just described, filler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I, I'd have to say, out of the songs on the album, that's probably my favorite as well. Yeah. Uh, really well, it's probably the song I'm most proud of on the album. Well, then when someone argues with me about what this, the best song on the album, I can tell them they're wrong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> damn right. <laughs> um, now, you guys have had the opportunity here to play quite a few live shows, including opening for bands like Big Elf and King's X. Um, how were some of those yeah. experiences? Well, I mean, for King's X, that was kind of mind-blowing, really. We um, were lucky because it, it was a contact of Charlie's that got us a gig. And um, it, was, it was in a big venue in Wolverhampton. It was the Wolfram Hall. And it was, it was nothing like we'd done before. It was huge. And um, it blew us away. But it really gave us a kind of a new first to, to get out there and really get it going. Um, and we also played at the Electric Ballroom with King's X, which was also mind-blowing. So that's great. And then uh, Big Elf were just a great, great bunch of guys. And we'd done a kind of mini tour with these guys around the UK, so Manchester, um, Nottingham and London, which was the final date, and that was really, really good. So the London show was packed out, and a uh, great atmosphere in the venue. It, well, we're just honoured really to play with such great bands and such such nice people to do. Oh, we also played with, uh, with Riverside as well, actually, um, which is kind of earlier on in our career. Mm -hmm. It was about two years ago now. That was also a very, you know, very good experience. Good. Yeah, I concur. I got to meet um, Big Elf when they toured the States here with Dream Theater, and they all very much seemed like very nice guys. Um, yeah, very down to earth, aren't they? <laughs> but, I, but I have one, one question concerning them. Did you get to use the time machine that they go through to the 70s to get their music and look? Did you get to test the time machine out? I, <laughs> I did ask, and they, they said no, no. That's be part of the band to do that. 
But it's weird, like you walked into the room and you saw them and it's like you're kind of wearing 70s tinted glasses <laughs> yeah. and everything everything was kind of tartan and brown and, and then he kind of wheeled on this Mellotron and um, kind of like rose, oh, it was crazy, it was crazy. But it, it was great, it's great to see such great you know, passion from those guys. Yeah, they, 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 are, they are very energetic to, to say the least. <laughs> And they they're living it. They're kind of really living it. Yeah. And uh, so I, I love. It was great to see. All right. Well, we're on the subject of touring here. You guys are confirmed for the Summer's End Festival in the UK and also Prague yeah. Power Europe. Yeah. So that's very very excited about those two shows. Th- those are the biggest crowds you'll have ever played to, I assume. Yeah. So I mean, especially the um, the Prague Power Europe. That's going to be the biggest crowd we've played to. Um, it's going to be it's going to be the first time we've um, actually travelled abroad, really, with the band. So that's going to be a, a very exciting. Um, and also, some of them we're very chuffed about playing there as well. I think that's the most kind of high-profile prog gig in the UK, and there's some good bands playing there as well. So it's going to be great, great lot of fun. Good. But um, hopefully, we'll receive well. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't think that'll be a problem. <laughs> as long as we nail it, it'll be okay. I think. Yes. Uh, any chance you've gotten some offers for an American festival coming up in the next year or two? Anything you can divulge about possibly coming overseas? Nothing, nothing yet. I mean, it'll obviously be quite a mission for us to get over there in terms of money because we're still in that stage where we, we've got our day jobs and to get time off work, and then it's going to cost a huge amount of money to get flights, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But one day we'd love the opportunity to get over there and perhaps do a festival date, you know, do a mini tour with a band, you know, get over there. Who knows, Progressive Nations, <laughs> fingers crossed. We're keeping my fingers crossed for that one. <laughs> yeah, you're just waiting for that phone call from Portnoy. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting, I'm still waiting. I'm standing by my phone every day just staring <laughs> at it. I wonder if it could happen, man. <laughs> oh. yeah, so that'd be a dream, dream come true. Well, there, there's few prog bands that, that don't have the dream of opening for Dream Theater one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> That would be it. I don't think I could contain myself uh, <laughs> if that actually uh, happened. <laughs> unfortunately for now, it looks like their next tour is going to be Evening With, so we might be waiting a while until anyone gets that chance again. Uh, I know. It'd probably be with Pain of Salvation. Yeah. Oh, so oh, Evening With Dream Theater, solely Dream Theater. That would be good. Four hours of Dream Theater. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> That'd um, be good. <laughs> would you say you enjoy recording new music more or playing it live? I think um, the whole the writing process of um, you know, getting an album done is quite stressful. It, it lasts for a long time, so it, it's enjoyable. It's rewarding at the end, but there's a lot of lot of work that goes into it. Uh, the recording process is equally um, stressful, but equally rewarding, and it's very enjoyable as well. Um, it's all about balancing your time, really, trying to fit it around working. That was the most stressful part of recording Aquarius, but um, I, it, it was great recording the album. Um, but I'd have to say, live is definitely where we're the strongest, and um, we all love playing live. It's, you just get a kind of raw, raw energy from playing from playing live. Mm-hmm. Um, I I would say that you guys have been very very well received by our listeners. I I've played. I believe the entire album at this point on the show, and oh, thanks. Thanks a lot, a lot at least half of it's been by request. I, oh, excellent! That's I, I played good. the first and last track, I think, two weeks back to back, and then every week after that, even if I already had you loaded, you got requested. <laughs> oh, that's that's really good to hear. And, and the 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 Prague World Press seems to be generally positive. I I was on Prague Archives the other day, and I believe your album is number one on their site. I wasn't looking for your album, but I just happened to cross seeing. I believe it's in the number one spot there right now. Wow, I didn't even know that. Well, that's, that's very good to know, too. And, I, and Classic Rock Presents Prague seemed to speak highly of you guys. They put you on your sampler CD. Yeah, well, yeah, our demo. Uh, one of the tracks from the demo was on the sampler CD, and um, we had a big feature, actually, in their magazine, mm-hmm. um, a page feature, which was... Um, very, very kind of helpful for us. Um, but they, they seem to really like the music, which is definitely a great help. So they're, they're behind us and they're supporting us, giving us good reviews and good exposure, really. Good. Now, however much it is 
nice to talk about the good reviews, or it's a lot more funny to talk about any negative reviews. Has there been any comments you found that are uh, not so nice? Uh, well, there's been a few, but I mean, it's like one size doesn't fit all, really. I think that's the key, because the, the reviewers are coming from a different different angle. They're, they're wanting maybe heavy, heavy music mm-hmm. and full-on metal, and it doesn't always deliver in, in that respect. So um, I can understand where they're coming from, but if you want to hear heavy metal, perhaps listen to a heavy metal band. Um, so I, I don't really take it to heart too much but obviously there's going to be bad reviews some people just don't get the long songs like why are you doing these long songs what are you playing at but um, you know fair enough don't have to listen to it if you don't want to and, and, and as soon as you shorten your songs up you know me and everyone else is going to be bitching at you for that exactly so you can't you can't <laughs> please everyone <laughs> um, exactly I think I think you know, we're just doing what we want to do and um, we're glad that the people we want to enjoy it are enjoying it so you know Good. It's doing its job. Um, now I know I know that the Aquarius has only been out a little while here, but um, what are you looking forward to in the future? Are, are you planning on keeping the same sound on future records? Are you looking to change it up a little bit? What can we expect? Yeah, well, I think um, well, I, I started writing the second album already, actually, and um, it's it's definitely sounding a bit heavier from um, what's already happened. Uh, it's kind of more guitar driven at the moment so just expect something a bit heavier but still kind of in that same vein you know cinematic um, themes mixed with guitars really the same kind of vibe but yeah. just a tinge heavier so already running the new album are, are we going to expect Flower King's like output of like four albums a year uh, I don't think we're not we're not that cool <laughs> <That's good. laughs> but, yeah, we're not that good. Yeah, I mean, no, I think, I don't know, I, 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 I really want to spend time and make it a great album, but then once it's written, we'll get into the, the rehearsal room, spend about eight months or so just rehearsing, fleshing it out, you know, rearranging certain sections, getting the solos written and getting the lyrics written. So I'll, I'll say, hopefully by kind of the later end of, of next year, all right, um, you heard it here first. By the end of next year, Haken will have another album out. You're, not, you're <laughs> now held to that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try and stick to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I certainly wish you luck in doing so, and I have one final question here. Go for it. Now, you guys are obviously heading towards superstardom. Oh, yeah, well, that's, you know, now, fingers crossed. Now, once the millions of dollars roll in and the Hollywood hotties are just flocking to you guys, will you be able to stay off the hard drugs and keep putting out more awesome albums like Aquarius? Uh, well, we'll definitely get onto the hard drugs, but I think that will that will take our music to the next level, surely. Listen to Pink Floyd, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and there you have it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I thank you very much, Hen. Okay, no worries, no worries. Like I said, this was Richard Hensall, the writer, guitarist, primary writer, guitarist, and keyboardist for Haken. Their debut album is Aquarius, and it is out now via Century Records. Any last words? Uh, buy it. <laughs> the famous <laughs> last quite... words, buy it. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's it. Keep it, keep it short and simple. Now, nah, we'll right. buy it, and you, you might enjoy it. If you, see, you never know. <laughs> Thank you very much, and have a good day, Hen. Okay, thank you, thank you.